might be surprised to learn that with all the congestion and urban sprawl here in the valley, we actually have a government agency charged with preserving open space. It's the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, and we elect its board of directors, and it's funded by our taxes. Authority is sort of a scary name, but their mission is to preserve open space in the valley, and that's surely benign. Today, Andrea McKenzie, the general manager of the Open Space Authority, will talk with us about their mission, challenges, and accomplishments. And then council member Silvia Arenas will tell us what's going on in her Evergreen Council District. We'll conclude with part two of our interview with Diane McKenna, a county supervisor from 1985 to 96, and a leader on regional issues and land use planning. That's what's coming up on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome Andrea McKenzie, Executive Director of the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority. Thanks for being with us today. So tell us what the Open Space Authority do, what's your job? Well, for your viewers who aren't familiar with us, we're a public land conservation agency. We've been around since 1993, 26 years, really created by passionate members of uh, Santa Clara County, the citizenry who wanted their legislatures to create a new open space agency that would protect for all time the natural resources and farmlands of Santa Clara County. So it was citizen created, of course the state had to authorize its existence, but it came from community. A very strong citizenry uh, here in Santa Clara County, elected officials, community activists, ordinary citizens who really cared about the future of Santa Clara County. And gave us a legacy. That's right. That we're still building. You're still building. But tell us about yourself. How did you come to the Open Space Authority? What qualified you to do this job? Well, I've been a passionate nature lover since I was a little kid. I ended up studying environmental studies and urban planning in college. Mm -hmm. And that kind of led me to this interesting intersect of where nature meets the urban area and what mm -hmm. happens in that interesting uh, interface. A lot of interesting things, a lot of important things. I've worked all around the Bay Area for different open space and regional park districts and in the last uh, eight years or so landed here in uh, the Santa Clara Valley. And you're the executive director of the agency. You have a staff of how many? They call me the general manager. Oh, the general manager. Okay, and, we'll correct uh, that. When I arrived in uh, 2011, we had about 11 staff, and today we have close to 40 staff. So you've grown the agency, That's you've right. grown funding for the agency. Tell us where the money comes from. Right. Well, you may know the San Francisco Bay Area has about six of these open space districts, each one of them funded a little bit differently, either property tax or sales tax. In our case, we're funded primarily by a parcel tax, which the voters approved in 2014 called Measure Q. That brings in uh, $8 million a year. We already had another funding stream from the early uh, 1990s, which uh, brought in $4 million. So for about $12 million a year, which is about uh, the cost of a cup of coffee per, per household <laughs> per year, we preserve natural resources, wildlife habitat, places for the public to recreate, uh, and important farmlands and ranch lands around the county. In the spirit of full disclosure, we should mention that I worked on the campaign in 2014, uh, rounding up endorsements for Measure Q. That's before I did Valley Politics. Since Valley Politics, I'm neutral on all issues, including ones like this. But Measure Q was a pretty remarkable vote. The voters of Santa Clara County in, in general have been very generous about tax increases for transportation and housing and other things. Measure Q was a little bit different test. We hadn't done that for a while. It passed with 68% of the vote, so it just squeaked through with, with the two-thirds. Um, what do you attribute that to? What, what, what made that campaign successful? Well, you don't pass a funding measure with two-thirds of the public approving it unless they believe in the mission and they believe you can deliver on that mission. And I think that, that at, at the root of it was behind the public support. We have a very, very diverse population here in Santa Clara County. We had 
very rich dialogue with the diverse communities across San Jose and across uh, this community. A lot of people uh, have a special place in their heart and in their culture for mm -hmm. the protection of nature, clean air, clean water, and passing on a legacy to future generations. And so we were able to tap into that uh, across Santa Clara Valley. Uh, so communication, education, and making the case for conservation, why it matters to uh, the Silicon Valley. Yeah, and that resonated, from my experience with the campaign, that resonated with uh, the full range of diversity in the valley. We got an incredibly, incredibly positive response from the Vietnamese community, the Spanish mm -hmm. community, Vietnamese and Spanish language publication. Uh, and as you say, it's part of those cultures as, as well as all the cultures of the valley. Uh, and if you look at the, the map of, of, of the votes, um, it's a yes vote virtually everywhere, just not a really big yes vote in a few places. So it was a very positive response to a, a, an effective campaign. So congratulations to the agency and the authority and the people who organized the campaign. Uh, but let's go a little more into specifics about what you're doing with the agency. So what, what, what are you doing with the money you're getting? Uh, well, actually, we should go back a step. Is that enough money to accomplish your mission, to acquire open space and preserve it? Well, as I said, we're a publicly funded land conservation agency. I would call us a small to medium agency with a big mission and a really big territory. So we cover a thousand square miles of Santa Clara County. So the cities of Santa Clara, Campbell, San Jose, uh, Milpitas, and uh, Morgan Hill. So a lot of population, a lot of territory, and dealing with one of the highest priced real estate markets in yeah. the United States. So no matter how much money we raise from the, the public and their generosity, it's a challenge to preserve nature, preserve agriculture, and connect people to nature. Uh, but we have to be as creative as we can. So we do it in two ways. We strategically decide where we should be spending our money with input from the public. And we leverage that modest amount we get from the public, so 12 million a year, with federal grants, state grants, and even foundation and private donations. And I would say for every dollar we raise, we raise $3 from those other sources. Wow. Um, so when most people think about open space, they think about kind of fields out in the boondocks. What's your agency doing about urban open space? Is open space closer to where people live and actually within cities? I think the public is getting increasingly sophisticated about the importance of nature close to home and in the uh, vitality and the sustainability of their communities. Back in the 70s and 80s, we talked a lot about wilderness protection and nature way out there and that maybe people would come out to it. Now we have to come into the cities and the urban communities and meet people where they are and people understand the importance of clean water, access to parks and green space, as important to their quality of life, to their children's quality of life. There are obvious advantages, uh, or rather there are advantages that are obvious to most people, but are there some things most people probably don't think about that are benefits from having open space reasonably nearby? When uh, I arrived at the Open Space Authority in 2011, uh, we were anticipating going to the voters with a public funding measure, and we knew we had to communicate clearly what the benefits of nature and green space, open space, are to the urban population. And so instead of only talking about wide open spaces way out in the boonies, as you called it, we needed to talk about the role of open space and nature to urban communities. And we call that a multi-benefit approach. So, so think about it. Where does our water come from? What contributes to clean air? Where does our food come from? Where do we see wildlife? Where do children play? And you cannot uh, look at any of those factors mm -hmm. and not consider nature in our urban communities and neighborhoods and close by. And so we made the case both multi-benefits uh, for people in our urban areas, and we made the business case for conservation of, of nature. And what do I mean by that? Oftentimes we think of it as a winner takes all, right? You have development that generates 
jobs and property taxes, and then you have open space and nature that generates nothing, or at least that's the perception. We worked very hard on a, a landmark report in 2014 in advance of the election that quantified the benefits of nature to Santa Clara County. Mm -hmm. And we found 1.6 to 3.9 billion dollars of services and benefits that go back into the local economy in terms of cleaning our air, filtering our water, protecting wildlife, uh, preventing them from becoming extinct, having parks and open space close to home, improved health benefits and reduced hospital costs, all these kind of things are benefits, economic benefits to the valley that are now quantifiable. What was the title of that report? Healthy Lands, Healthy Economies. Healthy Lands, Healthy Economies, and it's available on your website. It is. Today. That's right. Yes. So that's all good stuff. Where's the pushback come from? Where's resistance to your mission? Where, where, who's, is anybody opposed to open space? Well, you know, if you'd asked me this question 10 years ago or even five years ago, I think my answer might have been a little bit different. Historically, uh, we're told there is a, a Hatfield and McCoy kind of face off yeah. between development, tax generation, job generating development and protection of nature and a healthy planet. That's a false dichotomy, economy versus environment, right? Uh, or housing versus environment. We know now more than ever, we need a healthy planet. We've got to house our people. We need uh, our jobs close to where we live. We need uh, reliable transportation networks. So more than ever, we need to work together in all these things. And uh, the environment is not subordinate to the economy. The economy is subordinate to the environment. So I'm hearing sometimes cities and developers resist open space because they'd rather have economic development and you have to persuade them. Yeah, I think education is at the heart of it. So educating policy makers and decision makers. And I don't think uh, right out of the gate, uh, an elected official is against protection of nature and open space. But education is really important. The economic value of floodplains the economic value of having agriculture close to where urban communities are. The health benefits or the education benefits for our future generations to be able to get to parks and open space. These are not things that we do when we have a little extra change in our pocket. We build this in to strategic policies, programs, and funding. Uh, if we want to be successful, have strong economies, strong communities, healthy communities. Well, this sort of brings us to a recent really big event, and that is the acquisition of 900, over 900 acres of open space in Coyote Valley. And I've been around San Jose for a long time, as, as far back as I can remember, this was a struggle between environment and economy, between preserving the Coyote Valley, maybe for future development or for open space, or developing it sooner rather than later. Big corporations have been interested, Apple, uh, Cisco, uh, the city wants jobs, but somehow open space won out for these 900 plus acres and the city in partnership with the Open Space Authority and the Peninsula Open Space Trust has acquired those 900 acres. That, that's after 50 years of struggle over that, that chunk of the valley. How did you achieve that? Well, I think timing is everything. The evolution of public interest and public awareness, including of the climate crisis, the, uh, the end of the thinking that there will always be cheap land out there to expand into. It's no secret to you that San Jose for, for decades was the poster child for urban sprawl. And I think through the leadership of Mayor Licardo and the council members, we came together around a vision that was about people and nature in a sustainable Silicon Valley. And so, again, back to your question about developers and environmentalists facing off. You had here the last remaining valley floor, undeveloped valley floor in the San Francisco mm -hmm. Bay Area, for decades looked at for commercial industrial development and most recently for uh, warehouses, manufacturing and warehouses. 
that kind of thinking that had been on the books for a long time wasn't taking into account the economic value of nature and the uh, absolute risk to the city down the road if they paved over the last floodplains in the Silicon Valley. And we saw what happened in 2017 with the catastrophic flooding in downtown San Jose. And within a block of my house. We've seen the droughts. Coyote Valley overlays the drinking water supply for 1.8 million people. And the valley floor is also the last place wildlife can move between the two mountain ranges, Santa Cruz Mountains and the Diablo Range, where we've already invested $3 billion in conservation. It is the missing puzzle piece. 10 years ago, we didn't know those things. We didn't know those things 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but today we know them. And so the most important lesson here is informed decision making and bold action. And I think most of us realize now the time for incremental actions and nibbling around the edges is gone. Uh, we've got to take on these bold actions and the key uh, game changer was San Jose residents with the leadership of the mayor and the city council counting nature as infrastructure in mm -hmm. Measure T, putting $50 million into this land preservation deal. Andrea, we're out of time. That's a very great statement about the value of Coyote Valley. Congratulations to you and the others who brought this about. What a great Christmas present. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hello, Evergreen and Eastside. My name is Sylvia Arenas. I've devoted my professional career to public service. And as your city councilwoman in District 8, I'm focused on making it possible for families and children to have a high quality of life by encouraging economic development, improving public safety, and expanding family services. This year's budget continues to rebuild our police force, which was decimated by budget cuts. Since I've taken office, we've reversed that, and we're now on track to go from about 800 to 1,151 officers. Now we're pushing to get results and reduce burglaries and other crimes. I've also been leading an effort with my fellow female council members to revamp our police department's efforts to combat sexual assault. My focus on economic development has been to balance the need for more services like restaurants and grocery stores in our area, while working to prevent even worse traffic in our neighborhoods. I'm proud to announce that Sprouts has opened up on Capital Expressway and that Costco business is coming soon. We're also close to final approval on expanding light rail to East Ridge Mall. This year, I worked successfully to get San Jose to adopt a family-friendly initiative to find creative solutions to expand and access childcare, early learning, family-friendly facilities, paid family leave, and to make sure our homeless support programs focuses on homeless families and not just helping single men. I'm working to create community in Evergreen with events like Fall Family Festival, park activations, movie nights, and by building neighborhood associations. Let me know if you'd like to get involved. Thank you. Now here's part two of our interview with Diane McKenna, a county supervisor from 1985 to 96 and a leader on regional issues and land use planning. Let's take a look. You also were very active in regional government. Yes. Uh, Association of Bay Area Governments, which is all the counties and cities around the, the nine county Bay Area. Right. Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which is the same territory, but focusing on transportation. transportation. It seems like that's sort of a thankless task because it's not very high on the agenda of most of your constituents, I'm sure. Uh, why, what, what got really got you into regional planning and governance? Well, you know, I think that, I think it was probably my urban planning background that said, you know, what, what, you, did, what you develop in San Jose doesn't stop at the San Jose borders. It continues on. So I was looking at both ABAG for land use issues yeah. and Metropolitan Transportation Commission for transportation issues. And actually, a goal I had, you know, there are goals that you have that you accomplish and goals that you have that you don't accomplish. I, d I wasn't able to accomplish, I thought, a merger of those two. 
would be the best for the Bay Area. ABAG and MTC. MTC. Yeah. And now I it's understand finally, it's finally occurring. Finally happening. happening. Yeah. Because you, sh you can't divorce land use from transportation. Right. Right. So, uh, but I, I enjoyed that work. And I thought we are, we are the most populous county in the Bay Area. And I thought it was important to have that voice on both of those bodies, mm -hmm. you know, because we're, it, it, their decisions impact us so I much. think your successors on the board have felt that too, and we've, the county's been pretty well represented Senate, yes. on MTC and ABAG. I did, yes. Uh, well, another idea ahead of, ahead of its time, Diane. <laughs> so, uh, 1996 ended your 12 years on the board. Right. What have you been doing since? Well, um, I left the board, uh, and then I went to the California Transportation Commission for four years, and that's a governor's appointment. And again, it was the transportation wanting to right. see the Bay Area have right. a say in statewide transportation issues. Um, and so I lasted through that governor, and then the governor changed, and so um, I changed too, but I was there. I, I served on the Peninsula Open Space Trust, which is um, really, um, you know, preserving and protecting land, mm -hmm. both in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. Oh, you know, I did forget to mention the Open Space District. Th that was really something that we worked Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority? Authority? Right. You did that? Well, I, my, we start, ours was the yeah. first group, and we were unsuccessful, and realized that it wasn't my district, my supervisorial district. Yeah. So, so my me member of my staff became a member, helped that, and the leaders in in San Jose and uh, Morgan Hill and the rest um, took it on, and they eventually got it passed. Who was that staff member? John Gibbs. John Gibbs, right. San Jose State it's Political Science so alumnus. That's right. Yes. Right, and yes. a BA in. Uh, I think I'm in a master's in uh, business administration yeah. too. Yes. Yeah. But John actually, I think, became their first staff person oh. after they, after they, um, after the election was successful. But I, I digress. Yes. So I, so <laughs> I, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I start. I kept doing things I, I like to do in, in the, the children's shelter. Um, uh, when, when I left office, I read a newspaper story about a young man who was um, at San Jose State that lost his home because they closed the dormitories during, during the holidays. Mm -hmm. Then I said, we need to do a um, scholarship program for foster kids who don't have a home to go to. So it's now called Pivotal, but now we're providing scholarships to foster kids in college. So I'm on that board, mm -hmm. um, spur board, land use and transportation, yeah. San Jose. Still urban planning. planning still urban yeah. planning. Um, Foothill De Anza board I was on for a while. I tend to like things that have um, a beginning and an end. You know, like I, <laughs> I, I started the, I was on a charter. Term limits. Or, <laughs> well, I mean like the charter <laughs> review committee of Sunnyvale. Yeah. I served, did that. For Mid Penn Regional Open Space District, I chaired their, um, their committee that was looking at whether to go for a bond measure or not. So those kinds of projects, they come and they're completed and, and there's a sense of accomplishment with those. What's next? Ah. <laughs> well, I'm still on the spur and pivotal yeah. and, and those, so I, yeah. I think that's kind of enough. And for grandkids. Them. Yes. Who are, Getting older. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of kids, uh, what would your advice be for somebody young, interested in politics? Is local politics a good, a good, a good way to get in? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I tried the traditional way by going for a planning commission mm -hmm. or a park and rec commission. Commission I, appointments. Yeah. I think it really would be great, and I I know cities are looking for young people to do that. So I would say. You know, start with that to see if you like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might find that going to meetings um, is not your cup of tea. But if you like that and you liked that, then I would say, um, you know, talk, talk to people who are interested in the same subject you are and see if 
So Becky, when you run for office, you know there's a local environmental group or biking group or whatever. Or in smaller cities, just get out and work at it yourself. So, which door is door what door. I did. Yeah. Which is I, what I did. Yeah. I did precinct walking long before yeah. I did anything else. It still works. It's, it's harder. It's harder now because <laughs> nobody's home or they don't want to answer <laughs> the, door, the door. But if you can actually talk to people, that's still the most effective. I can't believe to this day, and I've been out of office over 20 years, people will say to me, I remember when you <laughs> came to my door. <laughs> It's, it's, still, it's still something that people remember. Well, that's so. remarkable. Well, Diane McKenna, we're out of time. Oh, wow. Thank you very much, and uh, good, luck with, good luck you. with your next endeavors. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. We'll be back next month with an all-new Valley Politics. Meanwhile, you can catch up on previous shows on our website at createvsj.org or on YouTube by searching for Create TV San Jose. You can let us know what you think about our show and suggest future topics or guests by email at valleypolitics at createvsj.org or on Twitter at valley underscore politics and by following us on Facebook. And now that's all, folks. Thanks for watching Valley Politics. See you next time.